from the science of paleontology, that would be fossils. Human and dinosaur footprints together. Well, there you go. This is uh, 1999, and the Paluxy Riverbed had dried up that year. So uh, it looked like a good time to map the fossil beds, because usually they're underwater. And so on the, your right, where the grass is, is one side of a rectangular sandbag perimeter. And I'm walking uh, down the way, and here's the sandbag, and then it comes over here, and it comes back behind where I was taking, or where the photographer was taking the picture. And we poured water in the track just so you can see the, the shape of it and the color of it. And so this is the world famous Taylor Trail of about 20 or so tracks down the, the muddy thing uh, as it, before it hardened, crossed at about a 30 degree angle with dinosaur tracks. Did humans and dinosaurs live at the same time? Obviously, they did. Here's one of uh, those 20 tracks, obviously a left foot. And uh, you can see the big toe, the mud up push between the toes, the toe scoop, the heel, and so on. This is the same track at high noon in about 20, what year was that? I think I'm, well, I don't have the date on it. But maybe you can still see the mud up push from the previous slide and the, the kind of where the toes push the mud back into it and then the heel, a little bit of erosion in the time that uh, changed. Uh, here's another one of those tracks. Notice the mud up push. When you step down in mud, you're going to displace a volume. And so it'll, it'll dome up. And, and that the up push is a very significant feature of that track. And here's what it looks like if you step in mud. And there again, you see the mud up push. Now, if that was to harden, which it probably would not because it wasn't during the time of the flood. That was the 1998 trip that we took to Utah. I took that and I think the guy just wanted to keep his new boots clean. <laughs> Here's uh, the Delk track that's right around the corner there. That's a very good photograph. I believe uh, David Lyons took that picture, professional photographer. And of course you see the big toe, the second, third, fourth, and fifth, and then the heel. And it was uh, the, the shoe, I mean the footprint of the dinosaur disturbed the footprint of the man. And uh, you can speculate on which one stepped first, but Seems like it might be the man and then the dinosaur. Yeah. And then does it look pretty much come this way, right under that picture? And you can see that we're looking at one and the same thing. I actually had this on my workbench at home, and it's about 100 pounds. I had another guy help me lift it up on the workbench, and we looked at it with uh, magnifying glass and floodlights to make sure that we weren't being fooled in any way. And it's the real deal. You have little roots coming up out of little fissures and things like that. Thank you very much, David. Here's uh, one of the tracks that's been found in this county, the Willett Track. It was found, I believe, uh, in 1956, I believe, over where the state park is. Oh, but isn't it illegal to take a track out of the state park? Well, it wasn't a state park then. It wasn't a state park until the McFall family donated that land to the state of Texas to make Dinosaur Valley State Park, 68. This is 56, so anything goes at, at that time in history. Now, when you talk about human footprints and you say Glen Rose in the same sentence, you're likely going to hear somebody say, oh, well, everybody knows those are carved. So does it look carved? Do you see chisel marks? I would, I would expect to see gouges and scrapes and straight lines and things like that. That looks like what I would expect it to look like if a man stepped into, a man or woman stepped into some mud. Do you agree? And uh, here's another view of it. And again, I just don't see any chisel marks. And looking, zooming in. If you want to see chisel marks, here they are. They're on the side to get the rock out, not to make the track, <laughs> you know. And uh, <clears throat> this is the Burdick track. Why would anybody cut a human track like this, it was to answer the challenge of an evolutionist because he said he wouldn't believe unless we cut it and he could see the inside matrix. I don't know, but I don't see how he could help from it. Look right here. This is the heel, and you see a discoloration, do you not? That's due to the compression of, let's call it soft mud into firm mud. And uh, it is concentric with the weight-bearing surface of a heel. Heel is one of the main weight-bearing things. And then all five toes show some kind of a pressure feature. 
Look at this little miniature straight line that is bent concentric with that tow curvature. A pressure disturbance right here. Have you ever gone on a firm beach footing that's wet and you see the, the sand lighten in front of your foot as your pressure is dissipated through the sand? And there's things like that that are doing that and happening there. And then the baby toe, you know, maybe half a dozen or more little tiny concentric formations. All of that, a fair-minded jury would have to say, that looks like a human foot made that. And here's a better look at the little baby toe. The Meister track, also around the corner. You can see that this, there's a, this is a shoe. It was actually, this was on top of that. And uh, so this little crater was sitting on top of that trilobite. And up here, there's a little crater for this little trilobite up there. But you see the heel line. I've got a, a point to it electronically here. There's the heel line. And look at, this is what the shoe would have actually looked like. This is like what the mud imprint would have looked like. It's worn on the outside rear of the heel like we wear our shoes. And this little trilobite is very clearly a trilobite and they even can identify some characteristics that are sufficient to classify it with its species name, Elrathia ginga. So that's three lobes, one, two, three of those little ridge lobes. This is supposedly one of the most primitive creatures ever to live and it has compound eyes like a fly. It's a very complex creature with a little segmented body kind of like armor plating a little bit, and there you go on that. Well, the professor that, William J. Meister, he was looking for these kind of trilobite fossils in Utah, and they're pretty common up there in uh, Gray Slate Rock, and he took it to his geologist buddy friend and said, look here, this, this looks unusual to me, what do you think? And the friend just was taken aback by it, and he said, where'd you find this? And he told him, last Sunday, we were looking around, and uh, he said, uh, he said, I want to buy this. And he said, I'll give you my life savings. And he offered him $250,000. Now, in 1968, that's probably worth about $5 million, something like that. And so let me say that if you want to buy one from me for $5 million, uh, we'll talk after the session today. <laughs> I would have considered selling it. But William Meister said, well, what are you going to do with it? And he said, oh, I'm going to destroy it. I'm going to destroy it. He's going to pulverize it. Now, why would he do that? That fossil evidence destroys his career. And if he's honest, he's going to have to say, I can't believe what I used to believe anymore. Because it's destroying his status with his fellow professors. You know, if you're going to be in that club, you've got to go all in or they'll kick you out. 